Welcome to the Minds of Mountain Film. My name is Emily Long and I'm the Program Director of Mountain Film and Telluride. We're here today with John Valiant, author of The Golden Spruce and The Tiger. So John, you didn't write your first book until you were 25. What were you doing before then? I didn't write my first book until I was uh, 40. 40? Yeah, and I was doing a lot of things. Yeah, so, um, so what were a few of those? Poo, uh, well, you know, I was, I was an English major and uh, with a bunch of you know, other fellow students who wanted to be writers and their goal was to go do an internship or something with a New York publisher and I just felt like the necktie was tightening around my neck just yeah. thinking about it. So I hitchhiked to Alaska instead and worked in commercial fishing and fishing boat uh, construction repair for a few years off and on, did construction. Uh, then went to work with juvenile delinquents on a remote island. Oh, wow. um, then uh, went to work uh, for this amazing um, interactive game that, that simulated global dynamics with hundreds of people at once. And we did that all over the world. And then I went to work for a company uh, who ran um, trainings with uh, corporations on gender and race issues. Oh, wow. And then after that, so then by then I was getting toward my mid-30s and had always been writing, you know, along the way. I'd been doing uh, a lot of songwriting. I was really into guitar and singing and all that. Mm -hmm. And 35 was coming up and I just thought, you know, it's time to, to go for something. And a good friend of mine was writing the magazine level already and mm -hmm. sort of coached me on how to put a pitch together and went in there and um, the guy said, love the pitch, but can't do it, got anything else. And I said, uh, I'd seen this motorcycle that had a Corvette car engine in it. And he said, and he didn't believe me. And he said, you go ride that and do a story. And yeah. sort of the barriers just kind of fell away after yeah. that. And so did you find, when you started writing for, at first did you find it really natural? Did you find like that it was easy to no, write? I, no, there was a lot I had to learn. There's so much. I mean, I think one reason it took me so long is I had to grow up. You really have to be pretty mature to, to be a writer, especially doing nonfiction. You know, immature fiction is exciting and you get into that person's head and if they're engagingly immature, it's lovely to read. But for nonfiction, you have to be much more disciplined, I think. And I was just letting much too much of myself in. And uh, so it was a steep learning curve, but I had great editors. You know, I had editors at Men's Journal and at The New Yorker. I think my agent got me in there really quickly and uh, that was, that, that was, those are my writing courses. So, so the one thing that I'm struck by your by your two books that that really kind of speaks to me is that the environment becomes a really strong character in the in the in the novel, um, and they're vibrant and complex. What do you find is is that what do you find in your in your writing that interests you the most as you're writing? I want people to feel. Mm -hmm. I want. I mean, just what Chris Jordan was saying today. Uh, I want them to feel what I feel, and because it's in print, you have to push your skills to the outer limits to be able to reach inside somebody else's head and heart with those yeah. images and yeah. feelings. And you have to find the image, the image or the or the narrative line that's going to speak to them. You know, you're you're serving them. You're not writing for you. So I'm, you know, thinking of this imaginary audience and wondering what what can I say? How can I say it? that will put them where I was, whether it's in the forest uh, or, you know, looking at a, you know, some form of wreckage, you know, how, yeah. do, how do you get them into that? Yeah. And that, that's a, an exciting challenge. Yeah, so um, I guess the other thing that also strikes me is that you take information from all these different sources, so it's geology, history, philosophy, politics, and then you create uh, essentially what becomes a thriller, like a page turner. You can't quit. You can't stop reading it. So how do you take uh, a nonfiction story and then turn it into something that <laughs> s s reads even uh, more interesting than fiction? It's not pretty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's to me that's what reality. I mean, the stories that engage me the most are where basically you know heavy industry and the myth world collide mm. and, and that's reality you know and everything you know politics is in there cultures in there mm -hmm. the environments in there people's dreams are in there people's terrors are in there uh, beauty is there yeah. you know all the things that have been being discussed so eloquently and demonstrated so eloquently at this festival um, you know that's what I'm after and right. 
so many stories are kind of narrow and linear and you can sort of see the agenda behind it. And okay. I'm trying to give a sort of dragon's, dragonfly's eye view, you know, all these, all these different facets and, yeah. and all these different lenses. Yeah. So you can get this kind of holistic, multidimensional understanding right. of, of what it is. It's very similar to one of my other favorite authors, Jared Diamond, in that oh sense of like just yeah. the scope of yes. the whole story is yeah. is much greater than the yeah. you know just there was this tiger, which brings me to the tiger. Can you tell us a bit about the story of the tiger? Well, you know, as uh, Sasha Snow made that wonderful film, Conflict Tiger, and you know I saw that and just that. The, honestly, the, the the feeling I had was my God, this is the golden spruce with stripes. And, the, and that you have this one potent and very bizarre creature doing things that they ordinarily don't do. And, and why is that happening? And, and for some reason, the, both those events you know, are, are these hubs around which all these other significant kind of planetary forces are manifesting in microcosm. And that's, you know, to someone who's interested in what I'm interested in, uh, it's an irresistible opportunity, right. and, and you know the Golden Spruce felt like a once-in-a-lifetime story. The Tiger feels like another once-in-a-lifetime story. I'd never expect to have a an, be able to write about an animal in that way again, and I feel incredibly lucky to do it. And um, people need to know this, and right. people have heard that tigers are endangered. They know that, and I want to get much further in, much further in there, so you can sort of see all sides of it including right. the tiger side, right. insofar as is possible, you know, from a human vantage. Well, we had, we had Nick Kristoff, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work last year, and he was speaking about the impact of the individual. Um, mm -hmm. Part of his work is, you know, going around the world in Africa especially and, and bringing the stories of Africa to an American population yeah. who is in many ways yeah. apathetic and not really interested right. in, right. you know, an, an orphan in Africa, that sort of thing. And he mm -hmm. says, instead of giving somebody a picture of a group of people who are starving, you give, give one picture of one person and, and give that person a name and tell that one person's story. Exactly. And that, and they've done all these these studies, you know, these these psychology studies that that prove that if you even put one more face in that image, people's Overall. ability to give is yes. exponentially smaller. And that's kind of yeah. the, like the tiger or the golden spruce. It's yeah. like this incredibly unique individual, whether it be a human being or a, an animal or a tree. Yeah actually brings the story so much closer to people's hearts. We're hardwired for that. I mean, what we're doing right now, this is something we were made to do, is you know, speak eye to eye and person to person. And if you can create a narrative, and we're, the other thing we do is how we make sense of our world is through stories. Mm -hmm. and, and reality is sort of this armature you know, that we hang stories on. And that's, um, you try to recreate that. You yeah. know, and, and people have done it so well, obviously, in these films. And you know, I try to do that. In, do you print. do you fall in love with the stories that you write? They are love affairs. They absolutely, yeah. you know, you're you're going to be stuck with them for years. Yeah. And you know, I could, I first encountered the Golden Spruce that that story almost ten years ago now, and I could talk about it till the sun went down. Yeah. Still, you know, and I because I love it. Right. I, I deeply love it yeah. and the process, but also the product. So the tiger um, is in some ways a cautionary tale, and it, it's bringing that story to people about an area that is still remote enough that there's still this great diversity, but yet it is coming into conflict with the humans that are nearby. Mm -hmm. um, as the population of humans nearby, in this case, or in any case um, of biodiversity, expands, what do you think it's going to take to keep the balance from tipping? Uh, it's it's going to take discipline and will, but it's also going to take, in, in the case of the tiger, it's going to take well-armed, well-trained, teams of defenders mm -hmm. and and that has that saved the tiger from extinction in the early 90s when perestroika had destabilized everything and the border with china was open that a lot of those teams have, have been cut now but if they were put back in place people respect those guys right and they have a very powerful impact and, and so if you have people on the ground with the ability to back up their mandate and you have a comprehensive uh, series of laws and strategies for how to maintain uh, a natural area, a habitat, if you will, um, it's possible to share it. Yeah. People have been sharing the habitat there, humans, tigers, leopards, bears, have been sharing that habitat for centuries. Right. 
and with very little conflict. I mean, that's what's so wonderful about that place. There isn't a tradition of, of tigers marauding humans. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's very rare, mm -hmm. and it's still rare. Right. And there's a lot of hope and possibility there. And it, it really does come down to, to policy um, and will. Right. So. And perhaps a little bit of money, too. Yeah, and yeah. much <laughs> less money than you would think. Yeah. You know, uh, these guards are paid $400 a month. Mm -hmm. And to risk their lives, and that's decent money over there. And so they need money for gas and money for you know one hopes not too much ammunition. But it's less than you would think. Yeah. It's like, you know to outfit one team is maybe 50 grand a year. Well, and when you think of the millions that have been spent on tiger conservation, flush down the toilet. Right. You know, futile, futile efforts. Uh, this is a place where a small amount of money could make a huge impact. And individual empowerment on on the level of. Yeah. These guys are proud of what they do. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is they, they do uh, outreach. You know, these guys, these you know, very tough dudes, yeah. you know, go into schools and, and talk about the importance of conservation, talk about tiger behavior and tiger habitat. Right. And, the, and, you know, if the tiger is there, it generally means that everything else is there. You know, it's this symbol, you know, right. and, and that's, um, that's powerful to everybody. And also, you know, what's not to like about a tiger? Right. You know, they're, they're, we notice them. Right. And, and they notice us. Yeah, yeah. they're amazing animals. Mm -hmm. So I, I do know that you've been living in Mexico for the past winter. Yeah. I was wondering if um, I knew you, were, you were down there with your family. Yeah. Were you resting or were you uh, researching for new projects? I was doing a lot more work on the tiger than I thought I would be, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Um, I was also kind of letting the well fill up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also found another story. and. But that's you know coming coming into question after being at this festival, honestly. Yeah. You know, I've just I've been very very affected yeah. by what I've seen, and you know what I had in next was a you know a novel, you know dealing with with a, this particular immigration story that mm -hmm. I was really interested in, and that feels pressing and urgent to me, and it's going on right now right. Uh, with a heavy cost. Um, but I almost you know I'm feeling now if something more more immediate isn't necessary, yeah. so. Uh, yeah, no, this has stirred me up in a powerful way. Great. Well, mm. I, we're so thrilled that, that you came to Mountain Film this year. I'm personally very thrilled that you came and, um, and so excited to see what's in the future. Well, thank you. No, it's uh, been transformative. Great. I appreciate it.